Question 1. Civil versus. Criminal fraud case distinction. Normal question. Which of the following statements correctly distinguishes between civil fraud and criminal fraud? A. Civil fraud requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt, while criminal fraud requires proof by a preponderance of the evidence. B. Criminal fraud typically results in monetary damages, while civil fraud may result in imprisonment. C. Criminal fraud involves actions punishable by the state, while civil fraud involves disputes between private parties. D. Both civil and criminal fraud require the plaintiff to demonstrate intent to defraud. Answer. C. Criminal fraud involves actions punishable by the state, while civil fraud involves disputes between private parties. Explanation. Criminal fraud is prosecuted by the government and involves penalties such as fines, restitution, or imprisonment as it violates laws established to protect public order. Civil fraud, on the other hand, is a private dispute typically resulting in monetary damages resolved in civil courts. Question 2. Scenario-based question on evidence handling. Maria, a certified fraud examiner, is conducting an investigation into alleged embezzlement within a company. During her investigation, she collects physical documents, emails, and recorded conversations as evidence. The company C, who demands access to all the collected evidence, including confidential witness statements. What should Maria do to ensure the integrity of the investigation and compliance with legal standards? They provide the C, O with unrestricted access to all collected evidence. B, share only the non-confidential evidence with the C, O and secure the rest in a tamper-proof system. C. Refuse to provide any evidence to the C. O. As it violates confidentiality agreements with witnesses. D. Consult legal counsel to determine which evidence can be disclosed without breaching confidentiality or compromising the investigation. Answer. D. Consult legal counsel to determine which evidence can be disclosed without breaching confidentiality or compromising the investigation. Explanation. Seeking legal counsel ensures compliance with laws governing confidentiality, admissibility, and witness protection. This step protects the integrity of the investigation and aligns with professional standards. Question 3. Anti-money laundering, ML, compliance, normal question. Under anti-money laundering, ML laws, which of the following actions would constitute a violation of compliance obligations for a financial institution? A. Failing to file a suspicious activity report, SAR, for a transaction above the reporting threshold with red flag indicators. B. Conducting customer due diligence, CDD, a politically exposed person, PEP, with enhanced scrutiny. C. Training employees on recognizing red flags for potential money laundering activities. D. Implementing and know your customer, KIC, program to verify customer identity. Answer. Failing to file a suspicious activity report, SAR, for a transaction above the reporting threshold with red flag indicators. Explanation. AML laws such as the U. S. Bank Secrecy Act BSA mandate that financial institutions report suspicious activities that may indicate money laundering. Failure to file. A SAR is a significant compliance violation and can result in severe penalties. Question 4. Chain of Custody and Evidence Handling. Which of the following actions is most likely to compromise the chain of custody for physical evidence in a fraud investigation? A. Documenting every transfer of the evidence with a timestamp and signature. B. Allowing an unauthorized person to access the evidence without recording their interaction. C. Storing the evidence in a tamper-proof container with access restricted to authorized personnel. D. Using a secure logbook to track the location and handling of the evidence at all times. Answer. B. Allowing an unauthorized person to access the evidence without recording their interaction. Explanation. Allowing unauthorized access without documentation breaks the chain of custody, potentially rendering the evidence admissible in court due to questions about its authenticity or integrity. Question 5. Scenario-based question on privacy laws and surveillance. Daniel, a certified fraud examiner, suspects an employee of embezzlement. He plans to install surveillance cameras in the office to monitor the employee's actions without informing the staff. He justifies this by citing the need for evidence. Which of the following best describes Daniel's legal and ethical obligations in this situation? A. Proceed with the installation as long as it's limited to public office areas. B. Inform the employees about the surveillance to ensure transparency and compliance with privacy laws. C. 
install the cameras in private areas such as restrooms as long as he keeps the footage confidential. D. Refrain from installing surveillance cameras and rely solely on direct evidence of wrongdoing. Answer. B. Inform the employees about the surveillance to ensure transparency and compliance with privacy laws. Explanation. Transparency and adherence to privacy laws are essential. Many jurisdictions, such as the General Data Protection Regulation GDPR, in the EU or similar laws in the EU. S. Require employee notification and consent for workplace monitoring. Question 6. Whistleblower protection laws. Under whistleblower protection laws, which of the following actions would most likely violate an employee's rights after reporting suspected fraud? A. Reassigning the employee to another department without reducing their pay or benefits. B. Terminating the employee's position due to their involvement in a protected whistleblower activity. C. Investigating the employee's claims in compliance with company policies. D. Providing the whistleblower with support to ensure they can perform their duties without retaliation. Answer. B. Terminating the employee's position due to their involvement in a protected whistleblower activity. Explanation. Terminating an employee for whistleblowing is a clear violation of whistleblower protection laws such as the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, SOX, in the U. S. Which prohibits retaliation against individuals who report corporate fraud or misconduct. Question 7. Tort law and fraudulent misrepresentation. Which of the following elements must a plaintiff typically prove to succeed in a tort claim for fraudulent misrepresentation? A. The defendant owed the plaintiff for fiduciary duty. B. The defendant acted negligently but without intent to deceive. C. The defendant knowingly made a false statement with the intent to induce the plaintiff to rely on A. D. The plaintiff suffered no actual damages but believed the defendant acted unethically. Answer. C. The defendant knowingly made a false statement with the intent to induce the plaintiff to rely on A. Explanation. Fraudulent misrepresentation requires proof that the defendant intentionally made. A false statement, the plaintiff relied on it, and the plaintiff suffered actual damages as a result. Intent and reliance are crucial elements. Question 8. Scenario-based question on search warrants and privacy. Olivia, a fraud examiner, discovers financial discrepancies in a company. She suspects the fraud involves personal documents stored in an employee's locked desk drawer. Without obtaining a warrant or the employee's consent, Olivia breaks into the drawer and finds incriminating evidence. What are the potential legal consequences of Olivia's actions? A. Olivia's actions are justified if the evidence proves fraud. B. The evidence is admissible in court as long as it is relevant. C. Olivia violated the employee's rights and the evidence may be excluded from legal proceedings. D. Olivia's actions are permissible if she acted in good faith. Answer. C. Olivia violated the employee's rights, and the evidence may be excluded from legal proceedings. Explanation. Olivia's actions violated search and seizure laws. Without a warrant, probable cause, or consent, the evidence is likely inadmissible under the exclusionary rule of Fourth Amendment in the U. S. Question 9. Penalties for violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, FEPA. Under the FCPA, what is the maximum criminal penalty for a corporation convicted of bribing foreign officials? A. $500,000 or twice the benefit sought, whichever is greater. B. $1 million or twice the benefit sought, whichever is greater. C. $2 million or twice the benefit sought, whichever is greater. D. $5 million or twice the benefit sought, whichever is greater. Answer. C. $2 million or twice the benefit sought, whichever is greater. Explanation. Under the FCPA, corporations can face criminal penalties of up to $2 million or twice the monetary benefit sought through bribery, whichever is greater. This penalty aims to deter corruption and ensure compliance. Question 10. Burden of proof in civil versus criminal fraud cases. In fraud cases, how does the burden of proof differ between civil and criminal proceedings? A. Civil cases require proof beyond a reasonable doubt, while criminal cases require a preponderance of the evidence. B. Both civil and criminal cases require proof beyond a reasonable doubt. C. Civil cases require a preponderance of the evidence, while criminal cases require proof beyond a reasonable doubt. D. Both civil and criminal cases require a clear and convincing standard of proof. Answer. 
C. Civil cases require a preponderance of the evidence, while criminal cases require proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Explanation. The standard of proof is lower in civil cases, where the plaintiff must prove their case is more likely than not a preponderance of the evidence. Criminal cases demand a higher standard beyond a reasonable doubt due to the potential for loss of liberty. Question 11. Scenario-based question on anti-money laundering ML compliance. Richard, an internal auditor at a multinational corporation, notices a series of small transactions from a company account to an overseas vendor that doesn't appear on the approved supplier list. The total amount of these transactions is just below the reporting threshold for suspicious activity. When Richard investigates further, he finds no legitimate invoices or contracts for these payments. What should Richard do to ensure compliance with AML regulations? They ignore the transactions since they fall below the reporting threshold. B. Report the transactions to his supervisor but take no further action. C. File a suspicious activity report, SAR, with the relevant authorities, even though the amounts are small. D. Attempt to contact the overseas vendor directly to verify the legitimacy of the payments. Answer. C. File a suspicious activity report, SAR, with the relevant authorities, even though the amounts are small. Explanation. Structuring transactions to avoid reporting thresholds, commonly known as smurfing, is a red flag for money laundering. Filing an SAR is the appropriate step under AML regulations, even if individual transactions are below the threshold. Question 12. Whistleblower protections and employer retaliation. Which of the following actions would most likely violate whistleblower protection laws? They Offering the whistleblower a severance package in exchange for resigning voluntarily. B. Conducting a fair and thorough investigation into the whistleblower's allegations. C. Terminating the whistleblower's employment for unrelated per performance documented before the complaint. D. Giving the whistleblower a demotion without providing a valid reason. Answer. D. Giving the whistleblower a demotion without providing a valid reason. Explanation. Demoting a whistleblower without justification is a form of retaliation and violates whistleblower protection laws such as the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, SOX. Retaliation can include adverse employment actions such as demotions, dismissals, or threats. Question 13. Admissibility of digital evidence in fraud cases. What is a key requirement for digital evidence to be admissible in court during a fraud case? A. It must be obtained from a public source to avoid privacy violations. B. It must be authenticated to prove it has not been altered. C. It must be corroborated by at least two witnesses. D. It must be encrypted to ensure data integrity. Answer. B. It must be authenticated to prove it has not been altered. Explanation. Authentication is essential for digital evidence to establish its reliability. Courts require proof that the evidence has not been tampered with and accurately represents the original data. Question 14. Scenario-based question on fiduciary duty. Susan is the CFO of a mid-sized corporation. She learns that her company CEO has been inflating revenue figures and financial reports to secure a bank loan. Susan confronts the CEO, who instructs her to remain silent and continue preparing reports with the false data. If Susan chooses to disclose this misconduct to the board or external auditors, what legal principle supports her decision? A. Breach of contract law. B. Fiduciary duty to the company and its shareholders. C. Anti-defamation laws protecting whistleblowers. D. Attorney-client privilege allowing disclosure. Answer. B. Fiduciary duty to the company and its shareholders. Explanation. As a corporate officer, Susan has a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of the company and its shareholders. This includes preventing fraudulent activities that could harm the organization. Question 15. The role of expert witnesses in fraud cases. Which of the following best describes the role of a certified fraud examine, CEO, acting as an expert witness in a fraud trial? A. To provide opinions on the defendant's guilt or innocence. B. To assist the court by explaining complex fraud schemes and presenting findings. C. To represent the interests of the party that hired them during cross-examination. D. To act as a mediator between the plaintiff and defendant. Answer. B. To assist the court by explaining complex fraud schemes and presenting findings. Explanation. 
CFE serve as expert witnesses by offering impartial, fact-based analysis of fraud cases to help the court understand technical and specialized information. They do not determine guilt or innocence. Question 16. Legal Authority in Fraud Investigations Which of the following actions can a private fraud investigator legally perform during an investigation? A. Conduct surveillance on private property without consent. B. Seize evidence without a warrant or permission. C. Interview witnesses voluntarily willing to provide information. D. Subpoena financial records from a suspect. Answer. C. Interview witnesses voluntarily willing to provide information. Explanation. Private investigators may interview witnesses as long as participation is voluntary and no coercion is involved. This respects legal boundaries while gathering information. Question 17. Scenario-based question on corporate governance. Robert is a member of the board of directors for a large public company. During a meeting, the CEO proposes a new business venture with a partner company. Robert notices that the partner company is partially owned by the CEO's close relatives. The CEO assures the board that the partnership will be profitable and does not disclose the family connection. What should Robert do in this situation to fulfill his duties as a board member? A. Support the partnership as long as the financial projections are strong. B. Raise concerns about the potential conflict of interest and request full disclosure. C. Abstain from voting on the proposal to avoid involvement. D. Approve the proposal but ask for an independent review after implementation. Answer. B. Raise concerns about the potential conflict of interest and request full disclosure. Explanation. As a board member, Robert has a fiduciary duty to act in the company's best interests. Addressing conflicts of interest ensures transparency and protects the company from potential harm. Question 18. Anti-corruption laws and bribery. Under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, FEPA, which of the following is considered an illegal act of bribery? A. Providing. A modest widely accepted cultural gift to a foreign government official. B. Offering cash to a foreign official to secure a business contract. C. Hosting a foreign official at a corporate event for the purpose of networking. D. Sponsoring training for foreign officials on the proper use of company products. Answer. B. Offering cash to a foreign official to secure a business contract. Explanation. Offering cash or anything of value to influence. A foreign official's decision violates the FCPA's anti-bribery provisions. Question 19. Chain of custody and fraud investigations. What is the primary purpose of maintaining a chain of custody for evidence in a fraud investigation? A. To establish the guilt of the accused in court. B. To ensure evidence is handled and transferred securely without tampering. C. To document the financial value of the evidence. D to protect the investigator from liability. Answer B. To ensure evidence is handled and transferred securely without tampering. Explanation. The chain of custody ensures that evidence is preserved in its original state and that its integrity can be verified during legal proceedings. This is critical for admissibility in court. Question 20. Scenario-based question on whistleblower protection. Emma, an employee at a financial institution, discovers that her company has been processing suspicious transactions that violate anti-money laundering Emma, regulations. Emma reports this activity to the appropriate authorities. Afterward, her employer demotes her and reduces her pay. Emma considers legal action based on her rights as a whistleblower. Which law primarily protects Emma from retaliation in this situation? A. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act, SOX. B. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, FEPA. C. The Graham Leach Blally at GBA. D. The Sherman Antitrust Act. Answer A. The Sarbanes Oxley Act, SOX. Explanation SOX includes provisions to protect whistleblowers who report fraud or violations of financial regulations, safeguarding them from retaliation by their employers. Question 21. Legal Aspects of Search and Seizure. Under what circumstances can law enforcement execute a search without a warrant in a fraud investigation? A. When evidence is located in a public space. B. When the suspect voluntarily consents to the search. C. When the investigator deems it necessary to prevent evidence destruction. D. When the evidence involves financial transactions.
Answer B. When the suspect voluntarily consents to the search. Explanation. A warrant is not required if the subject of the search gives informed voluntary consent. Question 22. Civil remedies for fraud. Which of the following is a common civil remedy available to plaintiffs in fraud cases? A. Imprisonment of the defendant. B. Financial restitution for the plaintiff. C. Revocation of professional licenses. D. Filing criminal charges against the defendant. Answer. B. Financial restitution for the plaintiff. Explanation. In civil fraud cases, courts often order defendants to compensate plaintiffs for losses incurred as a result of fraudulent activities. Question 23. Scenario-based question on privacy rights in fraud investigations. David, a certified fraud examiner, is investigating a case of suspected embezzlement in a corporation. During his investigation, he accesses an employee's private email account without their knowledge or consent, believing it contains evidence of fraud. The employee files a complaint claiming that David violated their privacy rights. Which of the following best describes David's legal liability? A. David acted legally because the investigation involved potential fraud. B. David violated privacy laws by accessing the employee's private account without authorization. C. David is protected by whistleblower laws in this situation. D. David can only be held liable if the email contained no evidence of fraud. Answer B. David violated privacy laws by accessing the employee's private account without authorization. Explanation. An authorized access to private email accounts infringes on privacy rights and violates laws such as the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, ECPA, in the U.S. Investigators must follow legal procedures to access private information. Question 24. Foreign Corrupt Practices at FEPA Compliance. What is a critical component of an effective compliance program under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, FEPA? A. Hiring external auditors to review all company finances annually. B. Providing regular training to employees on anti-bribery policies. C. Offering performance bonuses for securing international contracts. D. Allowing discretionary payments to expedite routine governmental actions. Answer. B. Providing regular training to employees on anti-bribery policies. Explanation. Employee training ensures awareness of anti-bribery laws and reduces the risk of violations, which is a cornerstone of FCPA compliance programs. Question 25. Admissibility of digital evidence. Which of the following is required to ensure digital evidence is admissible in court during a fraud trial? A. The evidence must be encrypted before collection. B. The evidence must be collected by a certified forensic examiner. C. The chain of custody must be properly documented. D. The evidence must come directly from the suspect's device. Answer. C. The chain of custody must be properly documented. Explanation. Properly documenting the chain of custody ensures that the evidence has not been tampered with and establishes its integrity and authenticity, which is critical for admissibility in court. Question 26. Scenario-based question on employment fraud and labor law. Maria, the human resources manager, discovers that a senior employee is misrepresenting their work hours and falsifying time records to claim overtime pay. Maria reports the issue to the company's legal department, but no action is taken. Maria considers reporting the matter to external regulatory authorities. What law might protect Maria if she faces retaliation for reporting this fraud externally? Eh? The Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA. B. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. C. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, FCPA. D. The Sherman Antitrust Act. Answer. B. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Explanation. The Dodd-Frank Act includes whistleblower protection provisions, shielding employees who report fraud or violations to external authorities. Question 27. Legal definitions of fraud. Which of the following best defines fraud as a criminal offense? A. Any act of deception performed for personal gain or to cause harm to another. B. Intentional misrepresentation of material facts to obtain. A benefit or cause a loss. C. Failure to disclose material information when under no obligation to do so. D. Mistakenly providing false information that leads to another's loss. Answer. 
b intentional misrepresentation of material facts to obtain a benefit or cause a loss explanation fraud as a criminal offense requires intentional deception involving material facts with the purpose of benefiting the perpetrator or harming another party question twenty eight role of expert witnesses in fraud cases which of the following is the primary role of a fraud examiner when acting as an expert witness in a fraud case a to provide an opinion on the guilt or innocence of the defendant b to present evidence in a manner that is understandable to the court c to represent the interests of the defendant in the case d to conduct a cross-examination of the prosecution's witnesses answer b to present evidence in a manner that is understandable to the court explanation as an expert witness the fraud examiner's role is to assist the court by explaining complex financial concepts and evidence in a clear and accessible manner ensuring that the judge or jury understands the key facts question twenty nine scenario based question on search warrant alex a fraud examiner is investigating a case of corporate fraud involving embezzlement after gathering initial evidence he decides to search the corporate office for further documents alex is aware that the company is under investigation by law enforcement but has not yet obtained a search warrant he proceeds with the search and discovers key evidence that could support the fraud allegations which of the following statements best describes the legality of alex's actions a alex's search is illegal because he did not obtain a warrant beforehand b alex's search is permissible because he is a fraud examiner and not law enforcement c alex's search is valid because it is related to an ongoing fraud investigation d alex's search is legal as long as he had reasonable suspicion that evidence would be found answer a alex's search is illegal because he did not obtain a warrant before an explanation alex as a private fraud examiner cannot perform a search without a warrant as he is not authorized to execute searches like law enforcement officers a search without a warrant typically violates the fourth amendment's protection against unreasonable searches and seizures question thirty corporate governance and fraud prevention which of the following best describes the role of corporate governance in preventing fraud within an organization they corporate governance ensures the company is legally obligated to hire external auditors for all financial transactions b corporate governance sets internal policies and controls that reduce the risk of fraudulent activities by employees and management c corporate governance limits the legal liability of the company in fraud cases by preventing lawsuits d corporate governance mandates that only upper management can review and approve financial transactions answer b corporate governance sets internal policies and controls that reduce the risk of fraudulent activities by employees and management explanation effective corporate governance establishes strong internal controls ethical guidelines and policies designed to detect and prevent fraudulent activities ensuring accountability and reducing the risk of fraud 